is there a better way to handle the problems of alcoholism, addiction, homelessness in this country than the strategies we we've been using up to now. Our next guest has written a very interesting article about that. Will McGrath has written for Pacific Standard, which is where this article, A Sober Utopia, appeared. He's written for a number of other publications too, including The Atlantic, Foreign Affairs, and the Christian Science Monitor. He won a prize for nonfiction, the Felice Buckvar Prize in 2015. So, uh, or 2014, excuse me, and a number of others as well. And here to talk about that Sober Utopia article with us now is Will McGrath. Will, thanks for coming on the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Uh, let's start with this. Uh, you wrote this article about a, a facility in um, rural Colorado. Uh, uh, let's start, and it's described in your subheading, your piece's subheading as a radical experiment that's underway to rehabilitate the state's most downtrodden residents. Uh, let me start with this, because I'm always curious about this. Uh, what gave you the idea to write this piece? Well, I, uh, before, before doing much journalism work, I worked in the social work world for a while. So I worked at a, a couple different homeless shelters and had worked with this community uh, and this population of people for a while. Um, I worked at a shelter in Arizona for a while and a shelter in Michigan for a while. So in the years since then, every once in a while, people just send me on information about this and a friend passed on information about this place here. And I started reading up a little bit about it and it just sounded like a very, uh, like they were doing a really interesting thing out there. So I went to go check it out myself and see uh, see what I could find out about the place. You know, one of the things I, I appreciated about your piece, Will, uh, before we even get into the experiment itself, is is <clears throat> the tone of respect and listening to the people who are, who are uh, participating in this, the, uh, the folks who had been homeless, the folks who had uh, alcoholism or addiction problems. I feel as if, uh, whether as writers or as a society as a whole, we don't listen to people enough. There's a point where they cease to become human to the larger society. And by doing that, I think we not only uh, fail to do something for them, but I think we make ourselves a little less human in the process. I don't know, maybe that's too philosophical, but uh, I don't know what you think of that, but that was one no, of my reactions. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, as a, as a society, we tend to, you know, people on the fringes of society, we tend to not see them too much. You know, we, we can, these things that are maybe less pretty to look at can be a little invisible to us. So um, I think it's important to, you know, turn, turn a gaze out there to the people on the fringes of society and having, you know, had a couple of years of working in this population, you just, I don't know, I've found people to be, who were homeless addicts found them generally to be very smart people, very, you know, competent people who have come on rough times in their lives and, you know, very interesting human beings out there who had great stories to tell. And when I went out to Four Lion, I was, I was, I was very grateful for how open people were talking with me and telling me these very, personal stories and, you know, traumatic stories, but everyone was very open and talking with me and honest. So I thought, you know, I, I just tried to do the best I could to represent people, uh, you know, as with, with empathy and, you know, give the honesty back that they gave to me. Well, I appreciated it. And, and let's now talk about the experiment itself, or if it's fair to call it an experiment, it's certainly a different model from that we usually see for handling either homelessness or problems of uh, alcoholism or addiction. What what was the facility, or if that's the right word, what was the place you visited like? What was it? Tell us about it. Yeah, so this place, Fort Lyon, is, it's started out uh, in the mid-1800s as an army fort, uh, and it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. It's several, several hours outside of Denver in the eastern plains of Colorado, and uh, it in its current form, I mean, it started as an army fort. At one point, it was run by the Navy as a tuberculosis hospital. 
At one point, the state of Colorado was running a minimum security prison there. And then it was closed for a while. Uh, and then this rehab community facility, whatever uh, you want to call it, the, the terms are a little hazy, but it, it kind of almost looks like a college campus out, you know, out in a rural part of Colorado. You know, there's a big uh, central administration building with ionic columns and dorms around. And so you could go out there and probably mistake it for a college campus in a way. Uh, so so they, experiment, just to jump in for a second, Will McGrath, so, so sure. uh, a variation from the norm number one when it comes to what we think of as shelters or what have you, is that it actually a pleasant physical environment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, very beautiful nature. It's kind of a quiet and contemplative place. Uh, you know, you could, yeah, it, it does not have what you would think of as the trappings of kind of a, an urban homeless shelter exactly. It feels more like a retreat uh, in a way mm -hmm. going out there. So, oh, so, so that itself kind of speaks of respect. And then, you know, I got the feeling, you know, the, the, the sense of your piece was almost as if it were more like a collective than a kind of hierarchically run, well, you're the patients, we're the, uh, we're the providers of service, you're the recipients, uh, that there was more of a collaborative feel to the whole place. Was that the right read of, of what, you, what you were saying? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely. And the, the co-founders of the place, uh, James Ginsburg and Bill Harrington, when they started this place, that was very specifically in mind to, you know, create this culture out at this place of yeah of of community of a non-hierarchical nature of saying kind of you know we are all in this together we're all trying to work together and support each other so yeah there's a there's a very communal feel out there i think some of that comes from the fact that so this facility uh after it was a prison and then closed and it was empty for a couple of years uh, the first people who came out there, the first kind of wave of people coming out there to get clean were fundamentally involved in rebuilding some of the facilities. So they had people out there who knew, who had had experience painting, painting walls. They had people who knew how to do flooring, helping to refloor the place. They had people who knew stuff about, you know, working on the sewage system and the plumbing system. There was a woman I, I, I talked to out there who had personally sewn all the curtains that hung throughout this, you know, 500 acre facility. So there's this real sense of the, the people who have come out there to get clean. Many of them literally were involved in building, you know, building up this facility. So you've got people there who feel kind of personally invested in this community that they've helped build out there. And when you visited, uh, at, at least uh, in uh, November of 2015, there were 225 people living there. So it's not a small place. Is it a rule-driven place? I mean, is it, you know, you, you visit certain rehabs, as you know, and it'll be, you know, you have to be up at 7.30, you have to do this and that, you have two hours of work shift, whatever it might be, um, whatever the specific rules of that place might be. Is this a rule-driven facility or is it more... Uh, contribute to, if you feel up to it, but uh, do what you want to do kind of place. Yeah, there's that's one of the kind of striking features of the place is there's, I mean, it struck me as a kind of radical autonomy going on out there. There's some very basic things that when people come out to this facility, they're expected to go to a few community meetings a week and check in with their counselors and you know there's some initial kind of classes about sobriety but in general once once this kind of very baseline level of you know involvement in the community is met you can really they, they encourage everyone out there to find recovery however it best 
suits them. So, I mean, there are people out there who swear by going to 12 step meetings and these residents have commuted, uh, have uh, created all these 12 step meetings. There are people I talk to out there who hate 12 step meetings and don't go to any 12 step meetings. There are people who spend their day, you know, playing basketball in the gym or just strolling around the campus. There's, there's a, a real sense of freedom to figure out how to get sober, how to get clean, you know, by yourself with, with the support of this community. Uh, and the, the, yeah, go ahead. And is there any sense, did you get any sense uh, of how successful or unsuccessful that sort of self-directed approach is compared to some of the more traditional approaches of either shelters or rehabs? Well, the, I mean, as far as certain numbers go, they, they claim to have a better, one of the kind of just tough realities of rehab, the number I've heard is that nationally, generally, the rehab rate is about 50% dropout. So there's just a lot of turnover of people, you know, not succeeding in rehab programs just because right. of the nature of addiction. Four Lion claims a, a much lower dropout rate. So they see that as a success of people, uh, of just people being more successful in this environment than the kind of standard, you know, what we think of as a normal rehab pro program. And any sense of why that might be? Is it the structure of the program itself or is it kind of a, a self-selecting population where the people who are drawn to it are more motivated or is it too hard to tell at this point? Yeah, I think, I mean, part of what, what the, what the, the, the guys who run the, this place, I think, would say is that there's a very different sense out there of this, of Four Lion being person-centric rather than program-centric. So the guys who started it, Ginsburg and Harrington, had this idea of saying, let's, you know, let's have the people who come out here tell us what they need to succeed rather than let's create a program and say comply with this program or else you're out so they okay. see that that kind of person-centric aspect of it as as being fundamental to the success of the place and did you get the sense that you, you've worked in that environment before? Did you get a, the sense that this was a model that could be replicated? Or did you feel that it, there were unique qualities either to the people running it or to the physical environment or to all of the above that it was uh, a, a, an interesting experiment but perhaps can't be duplicated elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, personally, I've never seen a place like this before, but I think... I think it certainly has the hallmarks of something that could be replicated. Um, one of the, one of the things that I know they tried to do early on out there, I think, I think one of the main obstacles to something like this succeeding somewhere is the, uh, is the kind of nimbyism. You know, if you have, you know, if you have the support of the surrounding community, that's going to help a place like this fly. But if you have, you know, community resistance, you've got a major obstacle there. So these, uh, they, they worked very hard from the beginning to have kind of a community buy-in. And they had, the, they had good political support as well from the beginning. They had the, uh, the county commissioner and the governor of Colorado, both were very supportive. So I think if you have the policymakers and lawmakers support early on that's a necessary step to replicate and then if you have the support of the community that's a very important step to uh to to replicate something like this and i think oh, I, that yeah that's yeah, a great yeah go ahead go ahead go ahead I, as you you mentioned the the physical property the place you know the place itself for a lion there, certainly there's something unique there about this contemplative 
environment. But I would guess that so one of the reasons the place started at 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 Four Lion was that in the the two years that this you know state owned property was empty, it to to maintain a property like that they were the state was paying or the state of the county was paying 150 grand per month just to keep the property empty. So the governor of Colorado had this plan to say like let's take this property that we're just pumping money into and try to do something useful for it. I would speculate that there are probably places like that in many states and many counties where there's, you know, a, an unused or an underused facility that is money is being pumped into that can probably have a more productive use, you know, a more positive yeah. use. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I think, you know, what you've laid out, the kind of combination of uh, a property like that, a, a, communitarian or collaborative respectful approach and political support before it starts i think that's the those are all great points and unfortunately we're going to have to leave it there but uh a, a very interesting sure. piece the piece is entitled a sober utopia it's in pacific standard magazine uh will will mcgrath thanks for coming on the program yes thanks so much for having me great to talk with you